Thank you for joining us today. The program is about to begin. Please make your way to your seats and silence your cell phones. for joining us today. The program is about to begin. Please make your way to your seats and silence your cell phones. Please take your seats. The program will begin momentarily. Good morning, everybody. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> I know it's, we're on day three, so you might be a little tired, but that's not good enough. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Especially about a guy who's going to talk about, we got to get it back together here. So there you go. <laughs> Terrific. Good morning, everybody. I'm Ruth Katz, um, director of Aspen Ideas Health. I hope you've had a terrific three days here. And what a terrific way to begin our last day then with this terrific conversation. I'm going to introduce our uh, interviewer, who actually needs no introduction. Andrea Mitchell is Chief Foreign Affairs and Chief Washington Correspondent at NBC News and host of Andrea Mitchell Reports on MSNBC. The award-winning journalist is also the author of Talking Back to Presidents, Dictators, and Assorted Scoundrels, her memoir. <laughs> I, it's a pretty appropriate title, you got to admit. Her memoir of experiences covering U.S. presidents, Congress, and foreign policy. I should also note that Andrea is a very good friend of the Aspen Institute. She has served in this role with a number of different programs, including mine, so I'm delighted to have her here. Um, she's also obviously here to interview a good friend of mine for a long time and a great Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murphy. With that, Andrea, I'll turn it over to you. And. I hope to see you all 10.30 back at the Big Tent for a terrific closing program. Thank you all for being here. Thank you both. Well, thanks so much to Ruth Katz and to Aspen Health and to all of the people who've organized this, this wonderful opportunity to talk to the Surgeon General. And thanks to all of you for coming. It's wonderful to be back here in Aspen. And Dr. Morthy, it's great to have you here. Thank you. Welcome to Aspen. Um, in addition to, of course, his role advancing the health and well-being of the nation, during his tenure, Dr. Murthy has made it a top priority to pay attention to the growing mental health crisis in America for adults, for youth, for children, uh, especially young people, striving to address the epidemic of loneliness and isolation in our country. His approach has been to live by one of the lessons that he learned when he was becoming a doctor, not to just treat the illness, but to treat the patient. Uh, Dr. Murthy, it's so great to have you here and have this opportunity. First, tell us why you issued your new advisory, the Surgeon General's Advisory on our Epidemic of Loneliness mm. and Isolation. Well, thanks, Andrew. And I'm so glad that we're having this conversation together and that we're here with all of you. I issued this advisory in May of 2023 on loneliness and isolation, and I called it an epidemic because it is. It turns out that loneliness and isolation are far more common than we thought, with one in two adults uh, reporting measurable levels of loneliness. So the numbers are actually much higher among young people. 
But the other thing that I found was that loneliness is also consequential. It really matters to our health. Uh, in terms of our mental health, people who struggle with being disconnected from others, either feeling lonely or being isolated, their risk of depression, anxiety, and suicide go up. But it's also physical illness that's impacted too. So people who struggle with that social disconnection, uh, they have an increased risk of premature death that's on par with smoking daily, and it's even greater than the risk of premature mortality that we see with obesity. And so whether it's an increased risk of heart disease uh, or dementia or other physical consequences, we, we come to see that loneliness really matters for our health and well-being. And so I issued the advisory because I wanted people to know that this is not just a bad feeling. It's something that really matters for our health and not just our individual health, but the health of society. Because in the report also, we laid out that communities that are more connected actually tend to be more economically prosperous. They tend to have lower rates of violence. They tend to be more resilient in the face of adversity, like hurricanes and tornadoes and other um, major challenges. And so however you look at it, whether you care about civic engagement, the health of your community, the health of individuals, investing in rebuilding social connection and community has to be an urgent priority for our country. Was this exacerbated by COVID? Yes. It was, but it predated COVID. And it, we have seen actually in the data that the loneliness crisis has actually been building for decades. Uh, for over half a century now, we've seen a reduction in the participation in uh, the, of people in community institutions that used to bring people together. So think about you know, faith organizations, recreational leagues, other service organizations in the community. So participation has gone down, down, down. But we've also had other factors that have been, has surfaced to drive uh, loneliness. I worry that for many people, young people in particular, that technology has not always been a boon. In fact, it's often been uh, a contributor to the loneliness that they are experiencing. Uh, and in our busy lives also, Andrea, and this is more a feature of modern life, we move around more, we change jobs more, we leave communities behind that we've built. Uh, and it's not that we shouldn't move or that we shouldn't uh, take a job that we're really excited about, but what we haven't done is we haven't figured out how to mitigate the consequences, the social consequences of our modern lifestyle. And that takes really intentional investment in social connection. And it's why in the advisory, we also laid out the framework for a national strategy to rebuild connection in America. You said that one out of every two adults is affected by this. So, you know, half the population, the adult yeah. population is affected by this. Uh, how do you connect it just medically? What is the connection between loneliness, isolation, and those physical manifestations? Well, I, I think that uh, it, loneliness is very interesting. It, it puts our body in a stress state, both a mental and a physiologic stress state. And we've all experienced stress in our life. Uh, think about the stress before you take a big exam or before you give a big speech or before you know, give a big grant deadline or- Do before, a big interview you know. with Aspen. <laughs> 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 or before you meet your future in-laws for the first time, you know, whatever it might be. Those moments of temporary stress can actually push you to perform better. They can, not always, but they can. The problem with stress is when it's chronic, when it lasts for a long period of time. That's actually when we start to see harmful effects on the body with levels of inflammation rising, with damage to tissue and blood vessels, and an increased incidence of heart disease in particular, but other physical illnesses as well. And so this is thought to be one of the ways in which chronic loneliness uh, can actually impact our, our physical health. And the truth is that, look, a, a lot of us don't talk about this because there's a sense of shame around loneliness, too, uh, that prevents the conversation from happening. Uh, people, and I felt that as a child growing up. I struggled a lot with loneliness, but, uh, and because I was shy, I was an introverted kid. I wanted to hang out with the other kids, but like, I didn't quite always know uh, how to break into those circles. Um, and I felt different in a lot of ways. You know, like, there weren't too many kids in my school who looked like me or had my background. Or, and so I felt different a lot. And so all this compounded to, to create a real sense of loneliness when I was a kid. But I didn't know what to do about it, and I didn't know how to talk about it. So I, even though I might, knew my parents loved me unconditionally, and still do, thankfully, to this day. Like, I never talked to them about it because I just felt like I was doing something wrong, like it was my fault. And that is the experience that so many people, kids and adults, have in America right now. They feel like, if I'm lonely, that means that I'm not lovable, I'm not likable. Worse, you know, I'm, I'm perhaps a loser of some sort. Like, think about what happens when we, on a college campus, orientation week. If you feel like staying in on a Friday night and reading a book, like, how is that looked upon? Right? Like most people, ah, that 
person, something's wrong with them. Like they should be wanting to go out to big parties, et cetera. So it's hard for people to talk about this because in our extroverted society, it feels like admitting to a failing. Um, but the reality is that so many of us were experiencing this, number one, but two, the, it, it's happening not because of personal failings, because there have been major changes in our life circumstances and the structural uh, forces that surround us, whether that's technology, whether that's cultural forces, you know, that push us to move and change and shift jobs and locations and communities often. Um, and if we don't talk about it, we'll never address it. And I'll lastly say that there, there's something there in the pandemic that I came to appreciate even more, which is the value of interaction with strangers. Right? So like, when we think about building a connected life, we often think about family and friends, and that's really important. But just think about like, what we're doing right here. We're gathered in a room with a lot of other people. You don't know necessarily everybody in this room, uh, unless you're Ruth Katz or Lori Tish, and you, you know, know this community incredibly well. Um, but, but still, there's something powerful about being together, about having a shared experience. Uh, I experienced that when I was writing a book a few years ago. I would sit in a coffee shop and work with strangers, but it felt nice just to be around other people. And a lot of us missed that, like during the pandemic. So all of these types of connections, intimate connections with best friends and, and spouses, so friendship connections, uh, you know, with people we would hang out with on weekends or go to birthday parties with, and what we think of as community connections uh, with people we may interact with at work or strangers in our, in our neighborhood or neighbors themselves, all of these matter to helping us feel more connected. And I'll lastly say this, the reason it's important to know those three groups is if you are married to someone, let's say, or you've got a long-term partner and you find out that your partner is struggling with loneliness, you might think, is this an indictment of our marriage? Is this my fault? Am I not showing it up enough for them? Am I not enough for them, period? The answer might not at all be related to your marriage because we all need intimate connections. We need these relational connections with friends and we need community connections. And if you've got a, you can have the best marriage in the world, but if you don't have a sense of community on the outside, if you don't have friends that you can reach out to for other needs or to talk to or just to spend time with, you may feel loneliness as well. So I mentioned that just so that as partners, you don't blame yourself if your uh, partner is in fact struggling with loneliness. It may not be your fault at all. Now, you've mentioned that the youth mental health crisis is the defining crisis yeah. of, our, of our nation right now. And speak more to that. You talked about how you felt as a child. Mm. Um, for one thing, and we'll get to social media in a moment because you have that other advisory that you, you issued uh, some time ago. Is it harder for children of color or children from other minority groups? Well, in terms of mental health? Yeah, so I think that um, the reason I call the, the youth mental health crisis the defining public health challenge of our time is, is twofold. One, it's because it's affecting our kids, and there's nothing more important to any society than the well being of our, our children. And our kids are telling us through stories and statistics again and again and again that they are struggling and suffering with record rates of suicide and self-harm. Uh, we're finding one in three girls, the adolescent girls, say that they seriously consider taking their own life in 2021. One in three is extraordinary. One in three. We saw that even before the pandemic, in the decade prior to the pandemic, there was a 57% rise in the suicide rate among kids. I mean, these are staggering numbers, and one of my worries is that we will get used to them and that we will become numb to them. Um, but that was one reason, is that this is incredibly common and it's happening to our kids. But the other reason has to do with the fact that mental health, our mental health, is the fuel that allows us to show up in our lives, right? If you're mental, struggling with your mental health, it impacts how you show up for your family, how you perform at work, how you perform at school, uh, if you're a young person in school, and it impacts how you show up in your community. It impacts civic engagement. Whatever you care about in society, it turns out that strong mental health is vital for it. And it's why I think of it as the fuel that enables us to show up in our lives, in our communities. That's why I think this is the defining mental health crisis of our time. And there are certain groups that are more uh, at risk for poor mental health outcomes right now. We know that communities that have historically uh, been marginalized or, or discriminated against in some way, whether they're racial and ethnic minorities, the LGBTQ community and others, can e feel, and we see it in the data, are more prone uh, to struggling with their mental health. We see, and look, you look at LGBTQ youth in particular, um, you know, I mentioned one in three girls, you know, who seriously consider taking their own life. That number is closer to 50% when you look at the LGBTQ community in youth in, in particular. So 
there is a tremendous amount of suffering that's happening in our country right now, with, in, among adolescents in particular. And I just feel like, you know, we can talk about the public health ways to address this, what we need to do in terms of treatment, in terms of prevention, in terms of stigma. But first and foremost, this is a moral imperative. This is a moral call to action to all of us. I mean, none of us would say, I suspect, that, that kids aren't important. I suspect if many of us who have children in our lives, whether they're your own kids, nieces, nephews, or others, when, if I, I were to ask you, like, who are the most important people in your life, you'd probably name like one of those kids, right. right? So we all value that, but there is a gap that has emerged between the values that we hold individually and the values that we are reflecting as a society. And I issued this advisory and we have been driving forward on the broader issue of youth mental health because it is time for us to close that gap, not only through policy, not only through programs, but by driving a different conversation in our country, by refocusing on what matters for our kids. And, and anyone who has kids knows that kids are listening all the time. I mean, I'm always so impressed, Andrea, by young people I meet around the country in terms of how much insight they have into what's happening to their generation and insight into what the origins are. Um, but they look at not just, they, they look, they're dealing with the loneliness crisis, they're dealing with social media, which often makes them feel worse about themselves and their friends. They're dealing with bullying online 24 seven. They're also dealing with an information environment that often can be quite negative, right? And so they're hearing all of this 24 seven. When I was a kid, if I, things were getting too negative, I wanted to turn off the, you know, the flow of information, I just turned off the TV, right? But that's not so easy for people to do now. But kids are also looking at the future. They're looking at the threat of climate change. They're looking at the violence that they see in their communities. Um, they're asking, is the future really better than the past? And they look at the, the generations ahead of them not doing enough. Uh, to address those threats, and they're worried that the answer is no. So we put all this together with the trauma kids are experiencing, specifically the trauma from violence, where gun violence has now become the number one cause of death among kids. Let me say that again. The number one cause of death among kids is now gun violence. That is a staggering uh, statistic. But all of these together are driving the youth mental health crisis. We can't solve them all individually on our own, but collectively, we have, I believe, a moral obligation to push forward the kind of policy solutions and programs that address these root causes. And if we don't, uh, we are going to see a continued, uh, this continued suffering and worsening statistics uh, in terms of how mental health is impacting our kids. And you spent the last year and a half talking to kids. Yeah. And came to conclusions about social media and the impact of social media mm. on children, which is an extension of what you're just talking about. You can no longer turn off the TV, and that's a single source mm. of external inputs. So talk to me about that and whether you think there should be some guidelines, even regulations by states mm. or the government, on what, what age so mm. yeah. children should use social media. These are good questions, and, and these questions, Andrew, are the ones that parents right, every day are grappling with. And the problem is that we have forced parents to grapple with them entirely on their own. Right. We said, okay, it's up to you to figure out these platforms that are rapidly evolving, that fundamentally change how your kids see themselves, each other, and the world. And by the way, that you never grew up with, <laughs> but figure it out. And do that on top of everything you're managing, especially a pandemic. I mean, that's just an incredibly unreasonable demand to make of parents. And just to give you a parallel, right? When a child turns 15 or 16, and they're ready to drive a car, or when a child is of an age where they need to, to use a, ba a car seat, right? You know, get a kid is first born and for the first several years of their life. We don't tell parents, you know what, why don't you go check out the car, inspect the brakes, test the frame out on your own, make sure it's strong enough in case of a collision. Like, that, that would be unreasonable to do, right? Because that requires specific expertise. It turns out that social media also requires expertise to assess safety. And that's expertise that a lot of us just don't have. And so part of what we have to do is to, to have the backs of parents here and recognize we place an unreasonable burden on them. And that is why I think policymakers have to step in here. I'll tell you why I'm concerned about the harms. It's because in the conversations I had with kids around the country, Andrea, they told me three things very consistently. And we did roundtables with kids all across the country. One, they said social media often makes them feel worse about themselves. Two, it makes them feel worse about their friendships as they watch kids doing stuff without them and they feel left out. But third, they said that it, they can't get off it because these platforms are built to maximize the amount of time our kids spend on them. 
there are features there that manipulate us into spending more and more and more time. And, and this isn't just purely a willpower thing. It's not like this generation of young people suddenly had a dramatic decrease in willpower compared to prior generations. It's that this is the desired, this is what it was designed for, to maximize time. That's what the revenue models are based on. And, and you know, you were in a situation where you've got the best product designers in the world designing platforms to maximize use, and you're asking a child to use the force of their willpower to somehow limit utilization, that is not, that, that's the definition of an unfair fight, right? And so this, is a play, so this is what kids tell me, but when you look at the data also, what you see is that when ki kids who use on, uh, you know, about three hours of social media a day or more uh, seem to have double the risk of experiencing symptoms of anxiety and depression, which is concerning because the average amount of use in the United States right now among adolescents is three and a half hours, right, per day. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is what kids are telling us through statistics as well is nearly half of the adolescents are saying using social media makes them feel worse about their own bodies. So the ways in which the, uh, the harm accrues to kids that I worry about is exposure to harmful content. Many kids are exposed to extreme violence, hypersexual content online. They can't watch a PG-13 movie, yet they're watching things that, you know, uh, in some cases are, you know, exceed what an R would be in an R-rated movie. The second is kids are exposed to a lot of bullying. Uh, online and harassment, including from strangers. Six in 10 adolescent girls say they've been approached by strangers uh, on, in social media in ways that made them feel uh, uncomfortable. Uh, but third, we see that there's a, an impact on self-esteem. This culture of comparison is dramatically accelerated online. And yes, we've always compared ourselves to each other for millennia, right? We've never done it at the kind of volume that, that it happens on social media, where some kids tell me they're looking at thousands of images of other kids, peers, strangers online, and constantly comparing themselves to that. But finally, there's the displacement effect, right? So if I'm using social media for three and a half hours a day, what am I not doing? And for many young people, that time is taking away from in-person interaction, from physical activity, and from sleep, which are three critical things young people need to grow and to thrive. You know, a third of adolescents, in fact, say that they are staying up to midnight or later on weeknights on their screens, which is largely social media use. So this is why we issued this advisory, because it is long past time for us to say, this problem is not getting fixed on its own. Parents have, this is too much for them to manage entirely on their own. We need to support them. It's not that parents shouldn't make decisions for their kids, they should. But we've got to do what we did with cars, with baby seats, with medications for kids, establish reliable safety standards for social media, actually enforce those safety standards and require the kind of data transparency from companies that we have not had. Independent researchers tell us all the time they want to assess the full uh, impact of social media on kids, but they can't get the data from the companies. So this is a problem. As a parent, I don't want to feel like people, the, uh, the vendors are hiding information from me about how a product my kid may be using is actually impacting them. So this is why policymakers need to step up, you know, and this is why we issued this advisory, because the problem's not going to fix itself. And I worry we will look back on this moment in five, ten years and say, what were we thinking? How did we unleash this extraordinary force on our kids with no evidence of safety? And that's the question we should be asking. Where is the evidence that these platforms are safe for our kids? That evidence is not there, and that's why we need to step up in terms of our policy making response. You know, you had a data point uh, that I read that the suicide rate for young people age 10 to 19 increased by 40% from 2001 to, to 2019. Yeah, it's, this that's horrifying. It's horrifying. Yeah, and you know, depending on how you, how you look at the data, you look at a a decade even closer uh, to the pandemic, and you see that among kids 10 through 24, uh, kids and young adults, that that increase was about 57%. So this problem has been getting worse and worse and worse. And this is not just kids being kids and adolescents always being tough and middle school being something that everyone has bad memories of. I mean, this is not the usual. There are forces here that prior generations never had to contend with. Uh, and that's what we've, we've got to recognize. And without intervention, again, it is not going to get better on its own. You know, I'll tell you, Andrew, like for a lot of us, this is very personal. Uh, like for me also, like when I have two small kids, they're, they're How old five. are they? So my son is six and my daughter is five. 
and uh, they're absolutely delightful. Great, great ages. Yeah, they're great ages. Um, and they say unexpected things. They're brutally honest, <laughs> which uh, can be painful sometimes. Uh, <laughs> but it's good. But like, the other day, like my five-year-old, who's um, just finished preschool last week, came home and asked my wife and I, my wife Alice and I, if we could post a picture on Instagram. She's in preschool. We don't <laughs> use Instagram at home. Like, she certainly, of course, doesn't have social media accounts, but her preschool classmates are talking about this, right? So this is all around us. But, but when we first found out, Andrea, that we were having our son, you know, six and a half years ago now, uh, I remember two things. One, being incredibly excited, uh, just looking at the, sitting on the bed with my wife, Alice, looking at that pregnancy test indicator and just realizing that, oh my God, our lives are going to change and feeling so excited about what was to come. And that was followed immediately by a feeling of terror, <laughs> uh, of thinking, oh my God, how am I going to do this? I have no idea how to really be a parent. You know, like prior generations, we grew up in extended households, you know, people, everyone was helping everyone, but we were living alone in Washington, D.C. without either of our families. Um, but the biggest reason I actually felt some trepidation and worry was I was looking at what was happening in the world around us. And it was a time where there were, they were a, a, it, there was a lot going on, but uh, it was in 2016, but we were dealing with issues around violence, racism, division and polarization in the country. There was so much that was happening, and I, I couldn't help but ask myself, like, what kind of world are we bringing our son into? And the truth is, none of us fully know, none of us can fully control what that world looks like. But it was on that day that I remember resolving with, with Alice, that we had to do everything in our power to make sure that the world was better for our kids and for other kids. And most fundamentally, that boiled down to making sure that the fear that was gripping the world and manifesting as anger, as jealousy, as rage, as intolerance, that we move from that ever closer to love, to feelings that were driven by kindness and generosity and concern for others, and that fear, love, dyad, we have been struggling there as a country. We've been locked in this, this deep, deep, difficult battle between love and fear. But whether which one wins out depends in large, in large part on us. This is not something you legislate. It's not something that you just put millions of dollars into and it goes away. Uh, whether or not our lives are informed by the core values of love and the values that stem from that, like kindness and generosity, uh, and service, that depends on the choices we make in our lives about how we treat other people, about whether we use our voices uh, to speak up for those who don't have a voice of their own. Uh, it has to do with what issues we choose to advocate for in the public square. It has to do with what kind of leaders we support uh, and choose and whether or not we believe that their values are consistent with the values we want in the world our kids inherit. All of those choices are the choices that shape the world, the world that our kids inherit. And I want to I mention that because I worry sometimes that in the face of what feel like intractable challenges, that we can lose sight of how much agency we actually have. Because when it comes to helping kids who are struggling with their mental health and well-being, it's often their local experience. Do they have somebody in their life who cares about them? Do strangers or teachers or neighbors reach out to be kind and help them? Do people in their life take an interest in who they are? When they make a mistake, do people not condemn them but give them a chance, recognizing that their intentions were good, even if they chose the wrong word or are messed up in some way? These are the experiences that all of us can shape in the lives of our children, in each other's lives. And that can create the kind of movement and snowball effect that can move us from a world that is gripped by fear to a world that is powered by love. Uh, um... On a positive note, there are data that show that the younger generations are more open about LGBTQ people, uh, more against smoking, yeah. more concerned about the environment. Mm -hmm. and we see this in political polling. So it, it does seem that there are some positive impacts of what they see in the yeah. environment around them. Well, it's very interesting, because, and this is one of the things that gives me hope, Andrea, is that I, I do feel like we have so much power and potential in the rising generation of adolescents and young adults. They're incredibly thoughtful. Uh, they're idealistic. A lot of them are actually are very values-driven, 
they're not just thinking about themselves or thinking about society more broadly. And they're also not waiting. They're not saying, okay, well, maybe when I finish graduate school or graduate from high school, maybe then I'll think about you know, making an impact. So many of them are building programs in their communities today that are helping to address issues like loneliness and isolation and, draw, and pushing forward conversations around mental health. And I will say that I think as a society, our ability to increasingly move past the stigma around mental health has been driven in large part by younger generations who have said this shouldn't be something that we should be ashamed of. So I think we have a lot of a lot to be proud of and, and to be encouraged by in terms of how young people are, are operating today. But with that said, I also think that young people need support, right? They need to know that if they're in crisis, there's a place that they can go for mental health care, right? And thankfully, I'm glad that we, for the last couple of years, we've set up 988, the crisis line, just like 911, but one line that you can call for mental health emergencies. We have made bigger investments, Andrew, in the last two years in expanding access to care than I've seen in the nearly 30 years that I've been in public health. And we have more certified community behavioral health centers that provide now mental health care to people regardless of insurance status. We have more counselors in our schools. Um, all of these, these are really important steps. They're not enough, but we've got to do more and the, the, because the gap has been so big and building for years. But there's a lot of reasons to feel encouraged uh, about where we are today. Um, we just need to keep our foot on that accelerator and you need to keep pushing further and faster because if, if there's one thing that's true about modern life, Andrew, which you know better than anyone, um, it's that our attention just moves so fast, right? From one subject to another, to another. And we can't afford to do that here. We can't afford to make a few investments in mental health and say, okay, we, we finished with mental health. We'll come back to it maybe in a decade and see if we're doing all right. Like we can't take that approach. We have to be here until the problem is solved, until everybody who needs care can get it, until we have actually address the root causes of what's driving the mental health crisis. And until we can talk about mental health, no differently than when we talk about physical health without any shame or stigma. When we talk about these really troubling data points with the, this crisis, mm -hmm. are there signals that parents and teachers can recognize in their kids, grandparents, mm -hmm. and take action? Yeah, so it's a good question. and. Um, I think that there are a number of things that you can look out for as a parent. Uh, like number one, there's data you can get from talking to your child. This sounds so obvious, but a lot of times we actually don't have conversations with kids about their mental health and well-being. Sometimes we wonder or worry, hey, if we bring it up, maybe it'll trigger problems for them, right? This is uh, something people used to believe a long time ago, never ask about suicide because it might trigger thoughts of suicide. But what we now know very clearly is asking about concern, mental health concerns does not create mental health concerns, right? So number one, we need to start having conversations with our kids about their mental health and well-being. And that can involve us sharing and being honest about how we are doing, about how we are managing our own mental health. Um, and in those conversations, even if your child never says anything to you for the first few times, then knowing that they can talk to you is actually really important because a lot of kids don't have somebody they feel they can talk to. What you can look out for as a parent, either through these conversations or through your observations, or you can look at, number one, the overall mood of your child. Every kid goes through difficult periods where they're sad or they're feeling anxious or they're worried. That's normal. That's not, if your, your child is not expected to be happy 100% of the time. But what matters is how long do those last? And do they impact your child's ability to function? And how severe are they? So if your child is experiencing moments of depression or anxiety that are leading them to consider taking their own life or harming them in some way, that's extreme, right? That's, uh, that, that, that is concerning. If it's lasting for a long period of time, for months, uh, for weeks and months, that's concerning. If you're finding uh, that it's impacting their sleep, their nutrition, right? their ability to eat and their appetite, uh, their desire to interact with friends or be around other people, uh, their engagement in school, or in other activities they used to find pleasurable, like sports or, or, or hanging out with friends, those are all warning signs that what your child may be experiencing in terms of uh, their mental health challenges may be consequential. And it's, look, it's never too early to ask for help and to seek out help. So, you know, it's talking to a counselor, raising the issue first with your pediatrician, uh, these are all very reasonable things to do. Uh, talking to a school, your school counselor, if your, your child's school has a counselor, which more and more do now, is also important. Um, and lastly, I'll just say this. Look, as parents, I think sometimes we're made to feel like we have to manage everything in our child's life by ourselves. 
If our child is struggling or suffering in, in any way, that reflects our failing as a parent. And I say that because I felt that too, you know, as a parent. I, my kids have had their own struggles uh, over, the time, over time, struggles in some ways that were made worse during the pandemic. And I've, you know, and my wife have like stayed up many nights wondering what did we do wrong? Did we do something we should be doing differently to help our kids get, you know, overcome some of the introversion and shyness that really accelerated from them after uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, after the, the, the most intense part of it. And, but the truth is that parenting was never a one or two person job. Like historically, we had communities that supported each other. We had extended families where people leaned on each other. And frankly, we had extended families where people saw long before they were parents, other kids being raised. They learned from that. They took from that. They grew from that. And we're in a lifestyle where we just don't have a lot of that now. Right. And so, and it's, and it's something we don't talk about. I think as parents is that parenting can be a very lonely experience. Right? It can be very lonely, especially when you first have a child. And, you know, people, I, I remember being on parental leave and coming back and uh, <laughs> a very well-meaning uh, person in our building said, oh my God, you must be so well-rested and so excited. You had three weeks off. And I was like, what are, what are you talking about? <laughs> I, said, I, I said, being back at work is going to be a lot easier than <laughs> what, where, what I was doing the last three weeks. But the point is that you, you're all of a sudden on a different sleep schedule. You're doing something you've never done before. A lot of times you don't have family around you and you feel like you have no license to complain at all, right? Because you were just blessed with this wonderful child. Like who, who, who's going to listen to you being ungrateful and complaining, right? That's how we think. But I say all of this because as parents, we've got to be there to support each other. And I, I you know, we've got to do that, you know, as men and as women. But I, I, I've heard from so many men recently who have said when they became parents, there was no inquiry from any of their guy friends about how it was going, being a new dad. There was no support group to go to. There was no, hey, how are you managing? Is everything okay? Do you need help? Can I bring over anything? Um, so, you know, across the board, I think we, we can and, and should do more to support each other in parenting, including in how we manage social media. You think about telling your child, okay, I'm gonna delay the use, your use of social media until after middle school. Is imagine like, and that's something that is, I think, a good thing to do. It's something I would advise to do. It's something we're going to do with our kids, but it's not an easy thing to do, right? Because the first thing your child might say is, you really want me to be the only person who's not on social media? Won't I feel even lonelier and left more left out? But imagine if like me and Celine and a bunch of other people in this room said, you know what, for the kids in our life, whether they're our kids or our nieces or nephews, whoever we're helping to raise, we're actually gonna make a pact and stick together on this. We're all gonna try to delay the use past middle school. And if our kid says, I'm the only one, we're gonna say, no, no, look at Celine's nephew, look at, uh, you know, uh, Lori's child, look at, you know, everybody else's kid, like we're actually doing this. Uh, Lori's child, look at, you know, everybody else's kid, like we're actually doing this together. Um, that's what we have to do. There is strength in numbers, but it's time for us to end the silent, suffering that happens when we're leading lonely lives. And that is what hap is happening to so many people in our country. And part of the reason we issued the, the advisory, Andrea, was not only to push forward solutions, but to push forward a different kind of conversation in our country where we realize that one of our greatest sources of strength is our connection with one another. This is how we evolved over thousands of years. A person, we have this like notion that, that you know, you've got to be independent, which means that you shouldn't need anybody else. That's what success is. Success is you're independent. You can do it all on your own. But when we were hunters and gatherers thousands of years ago, the person who said, you know what? I'm going to be independent. I'm going to be on my own. I don't need anybody else. Like that person got eaten by a predator. You know? <laughs> That person starved because they had an insufficient food supply and they weren't pooling their food with everyone else who realized that they actually did need each other. The bottom line is over thousands of years, we've evolved to work together, to build, to be in community with one another. It's only the last century plus that has been anomalous in that regard. And, and but it's come to a head now where the pain and suffering from our loneliness is impacting us so deeply that we have to make a conscious choice that we are finally going to lead people-centered lives and build a people-centered society. And that means in our own life, we're gonna make decisions about putting people first, about spending at least 15 minutes a day, reaching out to people we care about, 
making sure when we are talking to other people that we're giving them our full attention, that we're not distracted by devices, that we're gonna look for ways to serve each other in small ways, whether it's helping a colleague who's struggling on a given day of work or checking on a neighbor who just lost their spouse, because those small acts of service connect us. And as a society, we're gonna build programs, the social infrastructure that our country needs, the programs that bring people together to learn about one another, to get to know one another, and to do that across differences. These are programs that schools and workplaces can build. These are programs that faith organizations and YMCAs and other community organizations can run. But that is a social infrastructure we need now. Build, you know, bridges matter, highways matter, that traditional infrastructure matters, and we're doing a lot more there as a country. But social infrastructure is absolutely vital, and this is our chance uh, to revitalize the social infrastructure of our lives and our communities. And, and I want to leave some time for these wonderful people to ask their questions. But here we are all together uh, post-COVID, and we know how uh, much we all suffered in varying ways from the pandemic. I want to ask you, as like, just overnight, the intelligence community issued its report showing that there is no conclusion that the different agencies had different views, different assessments of the origin. Was it the marketplace, the wet markets? Was it you know, a lab accident? Uh, so there's no conclusion. There'll be more investigations on the Hill from all this, but they've studied it now for more than a year. What about the lack of transparency from China principally as COVID rates are increasing there? and concerns that this government, because of congressional budget cuts, doesn't have pandemic relief funds mm. to prepare for the next emergency, which was one of the reasons why the crisis in the initial months was mm -hmm. so poorly managed. Yeah, this is such an important question. And I, I, look, I think we have learned a lot from the very painful experience of the pandemic. I think we were able to develop vaccines in record time, and that helped us realize, you know what, it's possible to work on a much shorter timeline. We had a historic vaccine distribution effort uh, that brought vaccines to communities far faster than any other vaccine campaign we've had as a country. Um, and we had to do a lot in our health systems as well, uh, painstakingly, and it was very difficult, but to help prepare our hospitals and our doctors, our nurses, our entire healthcare infrastructure for how to deal with a new threat that comes on the scene quickly. There's a lot of learning that I think will put us in a much better place for the future. But where I worry about uh, is on the points that you raised, Andrea, which is that it feels like we, as a country, have a, we have this way of responding to crises after the fact and not before when it comes to the financial investment that's needed. You know, I was Surgeon General the first time under, under President Obama when Ebola and Zika were happening. And I remember how many months we waited for that Zika supplemental bill to be passed to give resources and how much money shifting had to happen within the department, taking money away from other priorities to fund urgent priorities. We shouldn't have to do that again and again and again. We shouldn't have a purely crisis response you know, when it comes to the investment that we make. We shouldn't be making those dollars available upfront in sufficient quantity that we can build the infrastructure uh, that we need. And of course, there should be transparency and accountability in how those funds are used. But the bottom line is we can't wait for the next crisis to put sufficient resources forward. So I do worry about that. The second piece I worry about is how we deal with this as a global community. Because any pandemic that comes in the future is going to, by definition, be a global threat, right? And simply thinking that we can just protect our own country and ignore everything that's happening in the rest of the world, that, that is, is no longer a theory that works. Um, COVID proved that, but other illnesses did too. But when it comes to even the COVID origins discussion, for example, it was the lack of transparency that as a global community that we were getting from China that actually prevented us from doing the kind of thorough and thoughtful investigation that needed to happen. And this is not a political thing. This is a scientific thing. Whenever there's a crisis, I mean, those of you who are working in healthcare systems like know this uh, well, uh, you know, that when, when there's an unexpected error that happens, when somebody dies unexpectedly, you do an investigation into the origins of that because you want to make sure that never happens again. That's what we had to do here too. Yet there was a lack of transparency that made a full and thorough investigation by the WHO 
uh, short of, of what we actually needed. And so we have ongoing concerns and open questions about what the true origin of COVID was, and they persist uh, with varying, uh, very, you know, a, a range of opinions within the intelligence community, in part because we lack that information. We have to ensure that whenever that next pandemic comes, and there will be a pandemic at some point, that the cooperation, the transparency, the honesty and openness from all countries is there, and that, that's a, that, that has to be a core part of the agreement uh, that we make and that we honor as a global community. Because just putting, saying yes on paper and not following through with it, that puts everyone at risk. And, and this is a situ situation where that lack of transparency, parents, transparency is, it's, not a, it's unacceptable, you know, when it comes to the health and safety and well-being of the whole world. And so it's a place where we should continue to push China, but where we should also make sure that every country knows what its obligations are when it comes to transparency uh, with regard to future pandemics. Let me now, we have microphones around and let's, go around the room and get as many questions as we can. Short questions, short answers, and we'll get to as many as possible. Uh, this lady right here, wait for the microphone so that we can pick it up on the live stream. They're right over here. Thank you. Um, good morning. So Vivek, we met almost a decade ago yeah. when um, my daughter was helping you to get confirmed because you were having a very uphill battle because you said, guns were bad for health <laughs> who would have thought <laughs> who would have and that was actually a very radical statement um surprisingly it's now a decade later and it seems like very little progress has been made um not not because of your great efforts but for lots of reasons that I, most of us can't understand um, but I'm wondering, you touched on a little bit, but I'm wondering, so I, saw, I heard on the news, MSNBC, I think just the other day, that there have been 302 mass murders, which means over four people just in the first half of this year, just in the first six months. So I'm wondering, for school children, yeah. how much of that is on their minds, that this is something that happens every day that could happen in their schools. How much of that is on their minds, and how do you see it manifesting yeah that's, a, Lori, that's such a great question because we cover it every day and every day it seems like we have a risk of normalizing that kind of outbreak yeah and you're exactly right and that, that's the word normalize that i worry most about is because people just assume that this is the norm it's the way it has to be nothing's going to change and I, I do worry about the impact on the mental health of kids like there are so many kids who tell us that they feel scared to go to school. They're doing lockdown drills, and every time they do that, it reminds them of the threat that they're under. And we also hear from parents who, when they drop their kids off of school, wonder, is this the day that something's gonna happen in my child's school? I have felt that as a parent. And I remember during one of the many mass shootings that happened you know, over the last few months, being on the way to drop off my child and wanting to just turn around and go back home. Right. And, you know, and this is just how the, the mental health strain on kids and their parents because of gun violence is just profound. And I, I don't think we appreciate it fully as a country. I think that we often think, well, the toll is on those who lose their lives. It is greatest on them, for sure, and on their families and loved ones. But it's also on the people who witness the violence, the communities that are traumatized, the kids that are worried about going to school, and the parents who don't know how to protect their kids anymore. I, last, I'll just say this. I, I think that you know, we've made some progress. I'd say in the last few years, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, first federal legislation in 30 years passed to finally try to take a step forward in addressing gun violence, did put billions of dollars into schools to help strengthen mental health uh, and well-being and strengthen security. But we have so much more to do to really get at the roots uh, you know, of, of this problem. And I just think this is not about, we've allowed ourselves to get into this this frame of thinking that this is about being pro-gun or anti-gun, and that is not the frame of this argument. This is about being pro-child or anti-child. Right? This is about are you willing, <laughs> are you willing to do whatever it takes to protect our children? Look, as parents, we know we would throw ourselves in front of a moving car to save our child if that's what was working. There is no limit on what most parents would do to save and protect their child. Well, why is it different as a society? 
Like, why are legislators and others throwing their hands up and saying, well, there's nothing we can do about this, when literally no other economically developed country in the world is dealing with the extent of gun violence that we're dealing with? So this is a, a failure of, a societal failure more broadly, but I think we have framed this debate wrong. I think when we ask ourselves, as we did with tobacco years ago, what, what do we need to do to protect our kids? The answer becomes a lot more clear, less about ideology, less about politics, more about the most important responsibility of any society, which is to protect our children. Okay, another question uh, right here with the pink scarf. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, first of all, your voice, is, your voice is so soothing, so I feel better already. <laughs> Thank you. Um, We're gonna have to put him on television. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm they Kathy. They have a face for television, you know? So, <laughs> I mean, for a face for a radio, rather. But, um, <laughs> I mean, stick to radio, I'll leave TV to you, Andrea. You're much better at it. No. I'm Kathy, I'm from Philadelphia, so. Oh. <laughs> um, I have uh, actually two quick questions. One is when you talk about social media and the guardrails and reducing yeah. all of the terrible things that happen to kids and, and adults as a result of you know, some of the impact of social media, what does a better day look like? How do we get there? What, is, what are those, when you talk about guardrails, uh, how do you, how do you unwind that? How do you, where do you, how do we get there? And then the second quick, quick question I have is, is that when I was a kid, you know, I used to watch my dad read the newspaper. I used to read the newspaper with my dad. Hmm. I listened to news and watched news early on. I'm a journalism major. So I, what you said kind of triggered my thought that like, you know, what are your thoughts on, you know, kids, watching news, whatever news they watch, you know, consuming news and information, because it's a different day in terms of news and information coming into a house. So they're little brains, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. I, I was just curious about your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, I think so. You know, it's not certainly a simple process of, of making sure that we go from where we are now to having a safer social media experience. But number one, we need to actually establish the standards. And we can actually learn a lot from what we did in, with, with auto safety uh, here. But we have to establish those standards. We have to, you know, policymakers need to actually put those into effect and determine who is going to actually enforce them uh, within government. Third, we need to actually work with parents and kids on the transition, right? Which is if a kid who might be using social media all the time, who's nine years old, and by the way, 40% of kids eight through 12 are on social media. Um, how do we help that child find a meaningful experience off of social media? How do we support their parents in doing that? And that's not just taking it away and leaving a vacuum. We have to fill that with other experiences that are positive, whether that's physical unstructured play, time with friends, you know, other engaging activities. So this is not simple, it's not easy, um, but it is necessary and it is urgent. Uh, and what I worry about is the longer we take to start driving this conversation and action forward, the longer it's gonna be until we establish a social media environment uh, that is safe for society and particularly that protects our kids. Maybe you have time for one really quick question, uh, lady in the pink blouse. I wanna wait for the microphone and thank you. Thank you. My yeah. name is Veron Blue and I am an Aspen Institute fellow and I am working on training passes especially African-American pastors, how to recognize and respond to the signs and symptoms of mental illness in their congregations and in their communities. And my question is, I am thinking of doing a program to educate families because that's the ultimate pre-crisis, it sounds like. So my question to you is, how impactful would a training be for families on the scale of one to 10, what do you think? As far as creating generational uh, change, because whatever we do with mental health has to be generational. We have to think about the next generation and the next. And so how impactful do you think a program would be if I did that to train and educate parents, whole families, giving them a certificate because usually mental illness is a generational thing, mm -hmm. so they could understand what their issue is in their families. Okay. And, and so that's my question. How impactful yeah. do you think so that will be? Really good question, and I'm so glad you asked it. 
I, think, I do think, you know, with the caveats around, of course, the nature of the training, et cetera, that conceptually a training could be very helpful for families because what we have assumed is that people just figure it out on their own, how to deal with mental health, how to talk about mental health, how to manage your emotions and adversity. It's actually not the reality. Like we all have to learn it somewhere, and many people aren't learning it anywhere. Uh, so I do think thoughtful, well-informed, evidence-based trainings can be helpful. Uh, one thing I'd point you to is David Satcher, from, uh, one of my predecessors, a Surgeon General who is now at Morehouse University, actually began a training program for parents specifically. And even though that's related to slightly different from what you're talking about, it's actually an interesting model for how to build trainings for families that can actually be evidence-based and can have an impact. And lastly, I'll just say this. I know we're closing uh, you know, this session, and I have so appreciated this time with all of you, and, and what a joy to be with Andrea as well, who I've admired, my admired for years uh, you know, from afar. But I do want to just bring this back to the, what I think is the most fundamental piece of what is going to drive change in our society. We look at all the ills before us, and we are, many of us, concerned, right? We're worried about the mental health crisis, but we're worried about polarization in our country. We're worried about the future, about climate change, we're particularly worried about whether we can come together and actually address these uh, together. But I do want to just remind all of us that change really does start with us. It does start locally. And when you make changes in your life to live a life that's more aligned with the core values we were talking about earlier, of kindness, of generosity, of service, and love, it not only impacts people in your life directly, but it inspires people around you. Um, I'll ask you to just think about this. I'm going to ask you to think about, just really quickly in 15 seconds, think about three people in your life. Think about somebody who has loved you over the course of your life, unconditionally, who has been there for you when you really needed them. Second, think about somebody that you have loved, who you have cared for over the years. And third, think about somebody in your life who is in need, who's having a hard time right now, who's struggling. And keep those three people in your head and in your heart for just a moment. What those three people remind us of is that we have the capacity to be loved, that we have the ability to give love, and that there is still great need for love in the world. And I mention this because that love that you convey to somebody else in a moment of kindness, in a generous moment, by showing up when there's a friend who's in need, by just listening when someone in the family is in crisis, that love is powerful. That love is healing. And there is no force I know, no medicine that I've written a prescription for, that is more powerful when it comes to healing than the force of love. And the fact that you have the ability to deliver it through your interactions with other people makes all of you healers. And so as you go out into the world and live the rest of your lives and think about how to shape and address what society looks like in the future, I want you to remember that, that you are healers, that all of us are healers, that we feel so much of the same pain, but we also can see what the world can look like if we only allow ourselves to lead with love to recognize that the fear may be there, but it doesn't have to define who we are. And if we do that, in our own small way, lead with love in our life, that those ripples will build into a wave, which will build into a movement that will change our country and shape it into the kind of country that our kids deserve, one where kids are supported, where we look out for each other, where even though we have disagreements, we can still fundamentally see the inherent goodness in one another, because that's what we need to thrive. So thank you all so much. Wow.